Okay, Bergson and the Holographic Theory of Mind. Part 60, quantum jumps and reality, which is to say there are no jumps. And we'll be looking at this in detail in Erwin Schrodinger's 1952 piece, which has apparently been totally lost, neglected, and ignored. So yes, we'll see time is indeed an indivisible flow. When we're looking at Schrodinger's warnings and objections, the fact that the wave equation means waves, not probabilities, not collapse. We'll be looking a little bit into the problem, core problem in the wave equation. And yes, we'll see there's a collapse, but it is of a certain quantum mechanic, quantum computing mythology. In 1952, Erwin Schrodinger published an article in the British Journal of or for the philosophy of science, titled Are There Quantum Jumps? He opened with a warning, an admonition to the physics community to quote, a theoretical science unaware that those of its constructs are considered relevant and momentous are destined eventually to be framed in concepts and words that have a grip on the educated community and become part and parcel of the general world picture. Where this is forgotten, Will necessarily be cut off from the rest of cultural mankind. Perhaps in rival in its grip on the educated community, the concept of quantum chumps. The transition from state, state one, say in an orbit, to state two, you know, to another orbit with no intermediate states. For example, from energy level one to energy level two. The grip is strong. How many times have I seen something like, time is discontinuous, the universe transforms into discrete jumps, our perception, that is our experience of continuity, stirring coffee, is only an illusion created by consciousness. In number 17 on Bohm, I noted even Bohm was in this grip to quote, what we are proposing here is that in the quantum domain, this model is a great deal better and is the classical notion of an interacting set of particles. Stop here, I note his model, the concrete version thereof was of a cylinder full of glycerin rotating an ink drop into it, implicitly enfolding it, and then rotating back again and explicitly unfolding it. Notice the continuous rotation. But he says in principle, discontinuities may be allowed in the manifest tracks. And these may provide an explanation of how an electron can go from one state to another without passing through states in between. So there we have it, Bohm's attempt to come to grips with what he perceived as the reality of quantum jumps, despite the fact that his model was a continuous model. I always thought it would take a bit of a Zen enlightenment to truly grasp how this could be. Schrodinger would note, in the inseparable union of speech and thought, the primacy, rather paradoxically, rests with speech. When we hear the same words again and again pronounced with authority, we are apt to forget that they were originally meant as an abbreviation. We are induced to believe they describe a reality. Schrodinger was far from impressed. There have been ingenious constructs of the human mind that give or gave an exceedingly accurate description of, obser of observed facts and have yet lost all interest except the historians. I am thinking of the theory of epicycles. I confess to the theoretical view that their modern counterpart in physical theory are quantum jumps. So the old theory of epicycles where everything's rotated around the earth as far as Friedrich are concerned, is not much worse than quantum jumps. The jumps are just a symbol, an index for wider problems. The intrinsic discreteness of the mathematical treatment of time, the inability to represent development in time, true development, thus inherent approximation only to physical transformations, the problem of boundaries on spatial states, having to set boundaries for the computational purposes, the intrinsic structural problem of the wave equation, the end of relativistic causality. 
I need to mention your thanks to Bob Heath, one of my old age correspondent partners in crime for sending me this article. Things we'll see. It's resonance, not wave packets or energy quanta. That is, as we looked at on the photoelectric effect in black body is this little partle, parcel of, energy, of, of, of wave energy quanta. More quanta, more amplitude. It's modification of vibrational modes, not wave packets. These, we'll see the return of wave amplitude lost with the photoelectric effect, as we pointed out in 45D. A particle will, will become, a, again, a wave spread throughout the whole of space with the implications. A particle's motion for wave mechanics, there is none. It cannot. It is already spread through the whole of space. Collision. So what does this mean for two particles to collide? Quantum mechanics probability interpretation, a la Copenhagen. Wrong. Relativistic causality. Gone. Look at the point. Spread to the whole of space. Quantum computing, its theoretical basis. Built entirely upon Copenhagen. Gone. The wave equation, where Schrodinger himself says it fails, that is, it cannot be taken literally, as Sean Carroll would have it, for example. There's so much for many worlds. His favorite, which is based on taking Schrodinger's equation literally. Schrodinger begins with the quantum mechanic history. Planck had discovered a discontinuity of Planck. A discontinuity or exchange of energy between a material system and radiation of light and heat. Planck was hesitant about this discreteness, and for good reason, Schrodinger notes. Einstein, in the photoelectric effect of the PE, blew this hesitancy away. And later, Bohr, explaining the light spectra, took discrete states as a genuine fact. But Bohr's great deficiency Silence about the period of transitions, as Schrodinger notes. Intermediary states were disallowed. Thus, trans these transitions became jumps. Then came quantum mechanics correction, that is, a new description, or via a new description of the states. For Schrodinger, more especially, wave mechanics, that is, the correction via wave mechanics. States were not abandoned, but shifted to the vision of proper modes. Like a bell struck, a, dumb, a drum head struck. Thus the superposition of comparatively, comparatively simple proper vibrations, where these modes are discrete. So we have a vibration of a single normal mode of, of a circular disk here, that's per wiki, with a pin boundary that we have a, a boundary set boundary condition along the entire outer edge, sort of like a drum head or a bell. Now, a normal mode of an oscillating system is a pattern of motion in which all parts of the system move sinusoidally with the same frequency and with a fixed phase relation. So here we have a standing wave above there. Notice that several standing waves the green, the red, the blue, the yellow. Notice that they're all crossing at the same nodal points. That is, they're in a fixed phase relation for their amplitude. So all amplitudes in phase. A physical object, such as a building, bridge, or a molecule, has a set of normal modes and their natural frequencies that depend on its structure, materials, and boundary conditions. The most general motion of a system is a superposition of its normal mode. So here we see the concept of superposition coming in. This is what Schrodinger meant by superposition. So the radiated frequency of the spectra and the spectral lines becomes the difference of proper frequencies. For example, if I, have, if I have two proper frequencies at 500 and 300, the difference is 200, and that's where I get the spectral line. 
Superposition does away with the prerogative of stationary states, he says. Read prerogative as privilege, stationary states being privileged or getting all the focus as explanatory or getting all the theoretical attention. A wave mechanical system is not affected in only one proper mode at a time, but all of its modes are affected. But the usage of energy levels or transitions or transition probabilities imply this, this notion of, of being affected one mode at a time. Planck's energy parcels reinforces this. It's a product of H is constant by a frequency. So E equals H nu, the frequency nu. It is a bundle of energy E lost by one system and gained by another. Now, a bit of history unstated by Herr Schrodinger, wave mechanics was co-opted by Born in 1926, the same year that Schrodinger is talking about. Trying to save particles, Born turned to turn the waves back into particles. Wave mechanics had come along and, and showed everything's waves. Oh, back to particles. But superposition in waves is natural. But how do you superimpose superpose particles? That is, how do they occupy the same space? Waves in multiple modes can occupy the same space. How do you do that with particles? Answer, you don't. Thus, Burn, Born turned this into the probability of locating the particle. See, the Born rule, the famous Born rule of Copenhagen. Schrodinger in 1927, I am averse to this conception. He did not like this. Rather, Schrodinger, it's resonance. He said, to quote, one ought to at least try to look on atomic frequencies just as frequencies and drop the idea of energy parcels. He makes a distinction between macroscopic and microscopic. We won't go into not necessary, but if, with respect to the microscopic exchange, he says it's controlled by a peculiar law of resonance. Nu one minus nu two for system. So frequency one minus the uh, new frequency, frequency one. And the second system, another frequency proper mode minus the second frequency. So here we're getting the difference of the difference in two proper frequencies, nu one minus nu prime one of the, of the one system must be equal to the difference of the two proper frequencies, nu two prime minus nu two of the other. The interaction is appropriately described as a gradual change, gradual, of the four proper vibrations in question. The four V nu one, nu prime one, nu two, nu prime two. People have kept to the habit of multiplying this equation by H and saying it means that the first system, index one, has dropped from energy level H nu one to level H nu prime one the balance being transformed to the second system, enabling it, enable it, it to rise from H nu two to H nu prime two. This interpretation is obsolete. It obstinately refuses to take stock of the principle of superposition, which enables us to envision simultaneous gradual changes in any and all amplitudes without surrendering the essential discontinuity, if any, namely that of the frequencies. He notes a typical experiment, a beam of cathode rays passed through a sodium vapor. Behind the vessel with the vapor, the beam passes an atomic field. The field deflects the beam and, and tells us the velocity of the, of the beam, a new velocity, lower. The spectrometer also inspects any light emitted. For a small initial velocity of the ray, nothing happens. But as the velocity of the beam increases, the, va the vapor begins to glow. I mean, the first spectral line of the principal series. Now, I put a note here. Note, frequency and velocity are equivalent in this case. Velocity equals lambda times the frequency. And given lambda is a constant, obviously, the higher the frequency, the higher the velocity. So. Again, the vapor begins to glow, 
emitting the first spectral line of the principal series, picked up by the spectrometer. The cathode ray is split into two, one with the initial velocity unchanged, one slower with loss of energy. And this becomes the frequency of the first spectral line times h, Planck's constant. So you might have an original frequency of 500, a new frequency of 300, and we're going to get a spectral line at 200. Increase the velocity more of that beam. Eventually, we'll get a second spectral line, etc., and a third ray of lower velocity. He says, this was and still is regarded as blatant evidence of the energy parcel view, or transferring energy parcels. But he says, but it is just as easily understood from the residence point of view. To quote, a cathode ray of particles of uniform velocity is a monochromatic beam of a de Broglie wave. Only when its frequency nu1 surpasses the frequency difference, nu2 minus nu1 prime, nu2 prime minus nu2, between the lowest nu2 and the second nu prime 2, proper frequencies of the sodium atom, so difference between the first system and the second system, is there a de Broglie frequency nu1 greater than zero that fulfills the resonance demand of equation one? Again, back to the equation he showed. Then the vibration nu prime one appears in the de Broglie wave and nu prime two among the atoms which begin to glow with frequency nu two, nu two prime minus nu two. Since Maxwell's electromagnetic vacuum is prepared for resonance with anything, the splitting of the cathode ray beam in the deviating electric field after passing the vapor is accounted for by de Broglie's wave equation. You notice other chemical reactions like 2H2 plus O2 going to 2H2O. Schrodinger, noting that one need not fear the wave equation's ability to handle this while thinking, it must necessarily be accounted for by the picturesque pageantry of individual molecules swallowing or respewing whole energy parcels being disrupted and recombined until they, until they eventually go to form one or two molecules of a new type. I deem the latter simply wrong. These are easy pictures, this little energy transfer parcel, parcel thing, hampering knowledge. And we are encouraged to take them literally by textbooks and popular essays, but also by language used in very highbrow technical treatises. And I would add, if Schrodinger was still alive in 2021 and by innumerable YouTube explanations. The photoelectric effect is one of the simplest photochemical reactions. We have a metal plate illuminated with a sufficiently high frequency. Electrons emerge with an energy E proportional to this frequency. Einstein in 1905 brought forth the hypothesis of light quanta, or discrete energy, light energies in the photoelectric effect. There is no time delay, says Schrodinger, even when the intensity of the incident light is so weak that according to the electron theory of Lorentz, which at the, at the time was in full swing, an electron would need half an hour to speed up to the velocity in question. But yet there's no such delay. A beam hits somewhere on that plate, some, somewhere causes electrons to blow off. He says this was, and I'm afraid still is, regarded as convincing evidence of the instantaneous transfer of the whole quanta of energy from the light to the electron. You can see my 45D. This is exactly how Top a popular YouTube explanator of physics, Doc Schuster, explains it. The orthodox interpretation, the incident light beam in each of its tens of thousands of plate electrons produces a teeny probability of taking within the next split second a leap into a higher translational frequency or energy. Thus, a small fraction of electrons will emerge 
and why the game starts without that delay. So this is my picture in number 45D on the photoelectric effect. We have a wave packet right there, wave packet, E equals H nu, which discharges an electron from its energy well, from its orbit. That is the, uh, looking up above where the flashlight is sending these wave packets into the uh, emitter, the uh, metal plate, little, little electrons are flying off that plate. They're in orbit, they're in energy wells, as Doc Schuster put it, and they happen to randomly hit one of the electrons, obviously. This probability idea in the uh, one, of these, one of these energy wells and knock it off with energy equal h nu. But Schrodinger says, but according to wave mechanics, as put forward by De Broglie and myself, the interpretation does produce without delay electronic wave trains of the higher frequency or higher velocity that we observe emerging from the metal. After this has been recognized, is the probability scheme any longer needed? Has the idea of mysterious sudden leaps of single electrons not become gratuitous? And the waves are there anyhow, and we are not at a loss to prove it. We only need to put a tube of crystal powder in the way of the emergent beam. So looking above there, we'll put a, a tube of crystal powder there in the way of those emerging little electrons from the, uh, from the plate and produce an interference pattern of the type first achieved by G.P. Thompson. So those are not just little electron packets, they're waves and we can prove it. End of story. So no, Schrodinger has brought amplitude changes back into the picture and resonance, both lost, as we noted in 45D, and both insisted on by Kessler in his analysis of the PE, trying to show why waves still work for the photoelectric effect. So Schrodinger begins to look at collisions in microsystems and this whole concept of energy parcel passing along. Problem one is the inconsistency of sharp energy states and abrupt transitions. If this simple scheme were workable, sharp energy states, abrupt transitions, it would need to be cast into a consistent theory. At the moment, no such theory exists and I could see no prospect for obtaining one. It is inconsistent because the mystery of the transitions continues since Planck and Bohr. Another intimately connected reason in the interaction of two microsystems, it is not clear which are the pure energy levels to distinguish. The choice rests with the mathematical technique, and this is problem number two. So problem number two is the weakness of the mathematical technique. The wave equation, he says, is made up of three additive parts. The two main components, if the systems do not interact, and the operator, their energy of interaction of the two systems. This is artificial. The two systems are simple. For analysis sake, they're kept simple. The whole complication, he says, is shoved into the interaction. This is termed a perturbation and it's dealt with by approximation, never a true solution. It only looks at a small interval of time, computes very small changes of amplitude during this, and the time rate of change is termed the probability of transition. The probability of transition, he says, by calling it so, one expresses the belief that after the interaction has taken place and the two systems have separated again, each of them will find itself in a pure sharp energy state. The computation does not give this result. The computation tells us that in either system, a host of pure energy states will be superposed Remember those proper modes, with a certain dependence between the partial amplitudes in the one system and those in the other. But one chooses to interpret this result as meaning that there will, uh, that there will be a complete exchange between only one pair of proper modes, one of the many to which the resonance condition holds. So this works, he says, kind of. It is inconsistent. The two systems are in a pure energy state at the start. Now the interaction, are very weak. We can say they are now one system. 
the splitting of the wave function into the two private parts or the two separate, separate systems and then operator equal a mathematical artifice, he says. However weak the interaction, the immediate consequence, the combined system is very far from one of its pure energy states. But this is not the result of a mutual physical influence. And this is prior to any physical change. It results in the slight distuning of the proper modes by the perturbation. But where is this happening? Things are happening in the math, in an abstract space and time. That's what he's implying. There's no real concrete physical development alteration of these modes. The concrete alteration of modes is taking place or being described. No real concrete physical development is being described. What were clear one tone proper modes in the isolated systems are no longer in the distuned systems, not nearly. You have to reshuffle them and, and combine them or superpose them in your mind in an intriguing fashion. Notice in the mind to find the proper modes of the combined system. I say in your mind, there is of course no immediate physical reshuffling. You just state that your combined system is very far from finding itself in one of its proper modes. And this is why anything happens at all. Startling statement. Again, this is a timeless abstraction. It is describing no physical, physical, real concrete development of physical fields over concrete time. And he says, why anything happens at all? Why? For it is a simple elementary and universally recognized statement of wave mechanics that an isolated system that vibrates exactly in one of its proper modes undergoes no change whatsoever. So look at the little bombs that Trinegar's throwing in here. It is worse. We, we likely visualize the two systems approaching and contacting each other from a distance. But this contradicts that the systems are in pure energy states. If so, they cannot be said to approach each other. To think of atoms and molecules in pure energy states, moving thither and hither, colliding and rebounding, contradicts the fundamental concepts of the theory. Where anything happens, we are not facing pure energy states. Why? He explains this a bit later on, in fact, in the second part of the article. Translatory motion with precisely fixed velocity is wave mechanically represented by a plain sinusoidal wave filling the whole of space. We'll take my favorite cube there, the whole of space. One might imagine then, what does all the particles look like? They're also all particles filling the whole of space. Those Schrodinger notes, this would require n, the n being the number of particles times three dimensions, an ungodly number of dimensions for, four, for three particles, nine dimensions. Two such plane waves, one pertaining to the first, the other to the second system, do not exhibit any feature representing distance from each other. They're both in the same space. So we'll put our rat there as a plane wave. Uh, Schrader's cat's got to make a comment. Now he looks at some details about the collisions in this, under this general point of the weakness of the mathematical technique. The first point in these details, the operator is nonlinear because we're multiplying the two systems com coming together. This, the first small change we get is correct, but the rest cannot be. To improve on the first approximation is very difficult. The current method is still linear. The operator is called small, but properly this applies only to the change. This may vary in various parts of the field, the effect of the operator. He says, for example, take the Stark effect, an example of this failure, splitting the spectral lines of atomic hydrogen by an external electric field. Schrodinger, via the approximation he's describing, successfully explained it in 1926, but he says, Lanskos later on, a few years later, showed a fundamental difficulty. Compared with the field of the nucleus, the perturbing external field 
is weak only in the neighborhood of the nucleus, where the internal field is strong. The ratio is reversed at moderate distances. Since the internal field fades away rapidly according to the inverse square law, one over the distance squared, while the external field is constant. This has the consequence that none of the Stark effect is really sharp. Second point he makes. Here he points out what we already noted. The microsystems cannot be conceived as approaching each other. Each is a plain sinusoidal wave filling the whole of space. They have no distance, quote unquote, from each other. They describe a state that virtually includes all possible distances down to the smallest at which the interaction is already in full swing. To choose for the initial state one that includes the two plane waves seems hazardous. One thereby disregards the building up of the interaction during the gradual approach. He considers imagining the plane wave approaching with a head, that is, a wave front. This too fails. What happens at the head differs significantly from at the tail. It is as the head of the wave plunges into the field, things are happening quite differently at the tail. In other words, there's a complex dynamic development over time. Quantum mechanics, says Schrodinger, has no solution to this. The problems Herr Kapitän Schrodinger exposes in his equation boggle one fully to embrace. One root problem, there's nothing real here, nothing concrete in terms of physical development over time being described. Some roots of this root, well, we can always note that the equation rests on the classic metaphysic with its time of discrete instance in which there can be then no true development of a physical system. A different manifestation of this at the core of the equation and the physics where there's identity. And in truth, we can't really separate the physics from the math anymore. So, so it's interesting to look at. So Euler's identity. For Feynman, our jewel, the jewel for physics. So Euler's formula, as opposed to identity, is e to the i x equal cosine x plus i sine x. So hold on, we're going to make this intuitive. When x equals pi up there, e to the i pi, then it becomes e to the i pi equal minus 1. This is Euler's identity. So since we've all forgotten cosines and sines, take a look at this for a second. Here we have our nice circle with the x and the y axis. And we have a radius that we're going to, the green, that we're going to circle around as such. And we'll pretend we have a flashlight that's projecting downward such that it shows where the radius projects on x. And then we'll see that the cosine is the projection of r upon x. It is the value of x where that projection or projected line lies. Thus, cosine equals x over r. When you put the whole thing in motion with our flashlight, the radius sweeping around, we're getting this set of values from range from 0 to 1. Note that at the 0 point, there is no projection of the radius on, on x. At 1, it's a 1 to 1 projection, so it's 1. Same for the sine. Now we're looking at the y-axis as far as the sine goes, with the radius sweeping around and the projection then of that radius on y, the value that it hits on y, sine equal y over r. Again, put it in motion with our flashlight. Note the flashlight's at right angles to the previous flashlight. Therefore, that's an orthogonal projection. The sine sweeps around, it is the radius sweeps around, projecting on the y-axis, and at the uh, zero point there, there is no projection on the y-axis, it's zero. So we have this orthogonal projection. So this is the intuition behind the wave equation. In fact, you have, you could look at it as 
our clock, sine and co cosine, orthogonal 2D projections, of what's called the 3D unit helix up there in a little corner there, as we rotate through space time as described by Euler's formula. But let's just consider the nature of e to the i pi. e is an infinite irrational number. It goes on forever. Pi, likewise, an irrational infinite number. It goes on forever. I is in the imaginary plane, square root of minus one, which doesn't actually exist. But note, we're, we're doing the sign in, in the imaginary plane, I sine t, or I sine theta. This is sitting in the Schrodinger equation. There's the I. And the h bar is also denoting the fact that we're dealing with this sine cosine thing. h bar is what's called the diminish h or, or, or um, Planck's little value. And we're going to realize, of course, instantly there's going to be an angular frequency in this unwinding or rolling of the sine and cosine, where angular frequency is defined as omega equals 2 pi times the frequency. And h bar is simply taking omega or taking that value h f over the angular frequency or h over 2 pi f or h equal 2 pi. In other words, we're because for, for a circle with a radius of 1, 1 half the circle is a pi. For a whole circle or a whole sweep around that uh, clock, one wave, we're spreading hf over that uh, wave. So just being spread out. My little h bar is not being shown there. We'll in a second. So we're evaluating this exponential function, e to the i pi, a strange thing because we're taking 2.71828 forever to the power of 3.145 forever. How to evaluate that? What's its limit, so to speak? Where does it end up? Well, if we take a bit from e to the i pi for dummies from the mythology. The way we would evaluate that is with this little equation right here, e to the i pi, with that expression there. Sort of like if we were evaluating what we'd get for um, uh, interest on a, on a on an interest payment. So in the but we're dealing with the complex number plane now because we have the i. So there we have the complex number plane, the i and the vertical axis. And we're looking at two complex numbers, 1.5 plus i and 1.2, 1, 1, plus, 1 plus 2i. So 1.5 plus i, 1 plus 2i. And if we were trying to multiply these two numbers, well, what we'd, we'd see we'd end up with basically the number up there in the green dot, which is a triangular representation of what we're doing on this complex number plane. We begin to get a set of a series of triangles. Suppose we were squaring the numbers. Well, so we're taking 1.5 plus i squared. Well, then we get the second triangle and 1 plus 1.5 plus i cubed, we're getting the point way up the top there. Let's put this on the unit circle. And then we'll start increasing the exponent. Here we've got to the third power, uh, bigger triangle. Now we'll take it to the fifth power. You see it's starting to sweep around. Take it to the 12th power. It's not only sweeping around, but starting to pull in toward minus one. 54th power. It'll pull in even more. Hundredth power, we're real close to minus one, approaching ever closer to minus one. And that's the uh, ultimate geometric representation of this intuition, e to the i pi equal minus one, except for one thing. This is always and only an approximation to minus one. It's never reached, that is, it's an infinite operation. An infinite operation is an infinite operation. 
we're going to have one plus i pi over 1,000, then over 1 million, then over uh, 2 million. It's going to keep right on going, and it's never going to truly hit minus 1. Yes, at limit, at infinity only. This is saying something profound at about the math at the heart of physics. Now, physics prefers this form of the identity, e to the i plus 1 equals 0. Mathematically correct, but there's a significant psychological difference, I suspect, and likely theoretical difference. Seeing e to the i, e to the i pi equals minus 1 at least reminds us that this merely approaches minus 1 and only gets there in limit. That is, never. That is, the system never captures all the information. Those little triangles each lose a bit of circular area. They never equal a whole circle. Nor can development over time simply be continually reset at zero, starting again from the same point over and over. And Schrodinger is saying here, in essence, the wave equation is not correct. It and its usage do not capture all the information, not the complexity of normal modes, not the complexity of their interaction, not the buildup of these interactions in time, not the unbounded scope of these systems. And it will get worse. When Sean Carroll contemplates the options for the measurement problem for solving it, his preference lands on the many worlds, as opposed to Bohm or Copenhagen or the GRW, etc. Why is that? He says, well, in the Copenhagen view, the equation is not always correct. It is correct until you observe something, and then the wave function collapses, and that collapse is not governed by the Schrodinger equation. True. To him, Many Worlds solves the measurement problem. Why? Because Everett, author of Many Worlds, gives the simplest possible answer. The wave equation, that's why he's got the Schrodinger equation there, central, is the wave function is in reality, and it is reality, and it is all of reality. There is nothing that is missing, nothing yet to be described. I'm saying he might want to check with the guy who wrote the equation. Now for the worst. Consider the records of single particle tracks, another section, next section of uh, Schrodinger's article. It is the broken tracks or particle showers, where there's showing successive decays of one particle from a pi to a mu to a epsilon, whatever. These are these not, he says, the record of quantum transitions. He says they certainly do not show the transformation of a couple of plane waves representing the colliding particles before the collision. But his opponent would say, he says, that's the point. Your waves are not real. They only indicate the probability of particle phenomena. He says, I mentioned, there are many experiments which we simply cannot account for without taking the wave to be a wave. Without taking the wave to be a wave, acting simultaneously throughout the region over which it spreads, not perhaps here or perhaps there, as the probability view would have it. Got to let that sink in. Remember Stuart Hameroff describing the probability view. How can something be in two places at the same time? How can it be here? And here, at the same time, probability view. Take the simplest case, he says, an alpha particle of a given initial velocity in a cloud chamber. It has a well-defined range. It is always stopped after traveling a distance of, say, five centimeters, and after producing a certain number of ionizations. It's always the same, corresponding to the particle expending its kinetic energy before coming to rest. How can this be understood, not as transferring an energy parcel, an energy parcel, but as resonance? Imagine the slowing down, he says, is due to an electric field. So we'll put an electric field there. What happens if that all the, 
constituents at the composite wave have their wavelength slowly, adiabotically, increased. Adiabotically, remember, the energy of oscillation over the frequency of oscillation. So that mass is slowly, adiabotically increased so that the group keeps together. One has to adopt the view that the ionizable medium influences the particle that passes through it in the same adiabotic fashion as a field would. And he says, I cannot imagine that this view is quite unacceptable. Once we have shaken off the nightmare that physical events consist in continual sequences of little fits and jerks, the handing of energy parcels from one particle to another. He's a little caustic there. Even catastrophic events do not force the fits and jerks view. They only occur with exceeding fast particles, exceedingly high frequencies. And this again shows slow adiabotic processes. For as he notes, slowness is relative to the rapidly oscillating wave field. He notes one has to use the auxiliary concept familiar to quantum physicists of wave parcels in more than three dimensions, actually three times the number of particles that come into play. So, so for four particles, we get 12 dimensions. This is coming from the configuration space, and not the psi, the psi the wave equation of one particle, psi x of t, or x is all three dimensions. Psi of n particles, is a psi, again, one wave function with x1, x2, x3 of t, that is coordinates, spatial coordinates for all, all the particles, one giant function. In fact, one can have the psi or the wave equation of the universe. This is the configuration space that he struggled with. In other words, this is what he looks to be referencing, the problem of the abstract configuration space for psi at the root of the ontology problem is the physical reality problem of psi that Schrodinger struggled with as we discussed in the mission problem in 45a. He knows the question, what are these particles anyhow, is momentous. And as if it can be understood that they, to quote, turn up with, within continuous wave trains, somewhat like the white crest in the trapping sea, and that in, in these in some cases, that in some cases they can constitute the only observable features of these wave trains. Interesting. These, he says, are no longer embarrassing questions. Now that we know what a particle is not, that is, it's not a durable little thing with individuality. But the intensive focus on these events in cloud chambers, complex as they are, reams of formalism, tempt us to model the world in such a way as to accommodate them, that is the particles, and ignore the rest. Look at the standard works on the diffraction of x-rays, he says, and the diffraction of material waves. To quote, one finds no pattern of thought that has yet been discovered to get on in these matters even one step without regarding the wave functions, Maxwell's field, and the de Broglie amplitudes of both the incident wave and those it encounters in, in the diffracting body, the waves it encounters, as describing something real. Here, real, he says, is not a controversial philosophical term. It means that the wave acts simultaneously throughout the whole region it covers, not either here or there. That would fail to account for the interference phenomena, or you need the whole wave acting across the whole space. So it's a wave. There is no probability of finding the particle, quote unquote, over here, over there, for the probability view. So, final paragraph. So, the epithet real means the momentous difference between both and and either or. The momentous difference. I challenge anyone to dispute the discrepancy away if he can. If you accept the current probability view, either or, in quantum mechanics, the single event observation becomes comparatively easy to tackle those little particles in the, way, in the chambers, but all the rest of physics, unfashionable at the moment, is lost to sight. So whoa, what have we just seen? In my opinion, Copenhagen destroyed. That is taking the square of the wave function as the probability of finding something, the location of a particle. 
that is the entire notion of the collapse, the born rule. Problematic then, the basis or rationale for quantum computing. Undermine relativistic causality, just as Bell advocated it should be, as we noted in 45b. Remember Schrodinger's wave acting simultaneously throughout the region. So that implies what the relativity of simultaneity is equally destroyed, crashed. Just as we've been arguing, or I've been arguing in uh, my discussions of relativity, that has no reality. An example of someone questioning the relativistic causality via experimental results, take a look at Gunter Niemitz. Niemitz. One can look at the e planet or channel Ecoplanet to see that uh, conference there. Undermine too, I think, effective field theory. There's no choice points that can be taken at static instants of zero time in, in Cauchy steps, sequential steps. Rather, we have simultaneous action that has to be dealt with throughout a region. One can talk or see this and play it. Sean Carroll's discussion of renormalization against this thought. Other problematics. A particle, either here or here, as Stuart Hemmerich liked to say. I don't think this is a superposition in Schrodinger's meaning. That is, in terms of the superposition of normal modes or proper modes. A particle with a spin up and spin down states, a superposition. Again, I think doubtful, no more than the cat, dead or alive, which Frederick argued has no reality, could not be true. Yet this is called so, it's the classic example of a qubit. Now, two particles in spin up or spin down in entanglement. Yes, this is Frederick's own term, but entanglement has a different meaning than superposition. And the above, however, is all the basis of the notion of collapse via the ever mysterious measurement, be it through observation, through experiment, through consciousness. And collapse has now historically become reified, now being viewed as decoherence, which is now curiously being seen as a gradual process, not an instantaneous inexplicably instantaneous process. Decoherence is emergent, so complex it cannot be truly explained. That is, we have the emergent transition from quantum to classical via de a developing process. Just like we have a views that say there's the emergence of consciousness from the great complexity of neural processes. We can't explain this complexity, can't describe it, but we declare consciousness emergent, and that's our explanation. Same game being played. And all this proceeding happily on this ignore Schrodinger basis. I'd say play this number 60, these points against this recent video by Arvind Ash on his channel titled How Quantum Mechanics Produces a Reality. I think one find it an interesting conceptual experience. It's hard to fully digest Schrodinger's piece to let all, to let all sink in, to uh, let the mind programming say fall away. Schrodinger's cat, it's often said, was just expressing his irritation over the superpositions of Copenhagen. But what we've just seen is he destroyed them with powerful arguments. It was far from just irritation. Simply ignoring it has an analogy that is ignoring Schrader or something to something such. Einstein dissects SR and shows it's full of major flaws. Physics just ignores them, continues right on using special relativity just as they like. Throughout, we've seen the glimmer of a, of a, of a Bergsonian implication. That is, we cannot truly isolate, truly box off a system like Bergson's glass of water with sugar slowly dissolving. 
the, the dissolving, it develops in time at a pace and a continuous change for that glass and the dissolution is embedded in the transformation of the universal field. And this is a transformation developing at a definite rate. And this pace, indivisible transformation, not a series of states, which builds, develops, each instant so-called reflecting the whole of the preceding instance like notes in a melody, is time. And time is a force. And physics must reckon with this. So full script. On Quora, recently there was a question. When does the wave function collapse in a natural environment? A physicist who was on Quora says, remember that the wave function collapse is a mathematical artifact, not a physical reality. He explains physics use of psi, the wave function in the notes. Now quantum physics is manifestly non-local. Nonetheless, we abhor non-locality. So instead, we come up with the following piece of mathematical fiction up until the moment when the electron interacts with the classical object, which is actually connected with it non-locally, we assume that it is a free electron and pretend that the classical object is not even there. It is something we do in our physics books to make the process more palatable to our taste, avoiding the business of non-locality. But to be more precise, hiding the business of non-locality behind the concept of wave function collapse. Yes, have we just seen, Schrodinger agrees, a mathematical fiction upon which they'll build physical quantum computers, by the way, and correlated or recently another question. Why is the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics the most popular among physicists? Again, from a physicist, who notes that the Copenhagen interp interpretation is indeed not an explanatory theory. However, I admit an explanatory theory would be nice, but it doesn't seem to be necessary. That's definitely an exciting and, and a noble pursuit. However, there are plenty of discoveries and technological breakthroughs awaiting those who don't question the tool they use. Virtually all our modern technology has been developed on the back of the descriptive nature of quantum theory. This claim, by the way, virtually all modern technology developed on the back of quantum theory is complete mythology. Tesla didn't need it. It is for good reason that Schrodinger admonished physics about their responsibility to the, to the world of thought. Folks are building theories of consciousness, even spirituality, out of the tofu blocks physics has provided in a sense, forced to do so, because you have to respect physics, its theory of time, which it's glommed on to, et cetera. It is time to listen to Herr Schrodinger. So next we'll see. Till then, signing off.